Why do you love Death Cab for Cutie? Gosh, yeah, it's so hard to put it into words, but there's something about Ben Gibbard's voice and his lyrics that just totally resonates with me. And um, I mean, the music is really good. They, they, they play really well, and I like the way that they sound. Why do you love Death Cab for Cutie? Uh, I think, for one, just kind of the ability to grow as as an artist, definitely. Um, I know that, you know, Ben Gibbard's writing has kind of uh, been a, a pretty similar style throughout his career, but I think in terms of, like, the style that they've been going for has changed quite, like, a, a couple distinct times throughout their career. Why do you love Death Cab for Cutie? Well, for me, it's really because, like, they just have, like, a lot of really good songs. Because, like, before August of 2022, my favorite band was Tally Hall, which is a similar brand to Death Cab. But they only have two albums in one sing single. Uh, Death Cab has, like... 10 studio albums, one acoustic album, and several EPs, all with amazing songs. Um, my favorite one's probably one of these two. We have the facts and transatlanticism. I remember I, when I, I first heard I'm trying to find blacking out the friction. I think that's plans or photo album. Oh yeah, it's track six on here. The CD case for this one is kind of screwed up. I gotta get a new CD case for the photo album, but... My name is Max. And I've been, I would say, a dedicated fan of Death Cab for Cutie for about three or four years now. I started listening to them in college, and I first listened to Transatlanticism. Uh, and the first time listening through it, I was like, huh, that's, that's a pretty weird album. And then I listened to it again, and I was like, oh no, <laughs> I really like it. Like when Squidward uh, is looking at uh, what's his face, what, uh, what's what's the what's Squidward's ne nemesis name? SpongeBob. No, <laughs> SpongeBob. When Squidward sees Squilliam, and he goes, "Oh no, he's hot!" <laughs> and it's me looking at Death Cab for Cuties like hundred song library. I came up with the idea of this project of figuring out why Death Cab for Cutie is such a, a powerhouse of a band and so popular with so many people, despite the majority of their music being, tackling these, these really sad issues, depression, aging, death, uh, relationships uh, that never panned out or, or that took a wrong turn somewhere along the ways. And I decided the best thing for this project to to really figure out why that is is to talk to some of the most dedicated fans I could find, as in whoever responded to my DMs on Discord and Reddit. <laughs> so. This is Toad. His favorite album is Transatlanticism. And this is Momo. Her, uh, she likes the postal service. Can you introduce yourself and tell me how long you've been a fan of Death Cab for Cutie? 
Sure. Yeah. Uh, my name's Andrew, um, and I'm a Death Cab fan. So let's see. I got into them about 2005. Um, I was living in Alabama, and a friend of mine said, "Hey, you got to check this band out," and uh, I did. And that was basically it. They became one of my favorite bands very, very quickly. Um, so yeah, it was that was the song was "I Will Fall Into the Dark" from Plans. Of course, they got the whole Plans album, um, and their and Transatlanticism. And just like fell in love with those, and then I kind of went back and figured uh, filled in the rest of their discography, kind of from there. I guess I've been a fan since. Uh, well, actually, I I found my like first Death Cab song when I was like ten, um, but I wasn't really a fan and listening to a lot of their stuff until uh, I think I was like uh, fifteen or sixteen. So about like eight years now. Mm. And what was that? Uh, what was the song? And then when you were like fifteen, sixteen, what uh, brought you back in? Uh, I think the f- the first song was "Summer Skin," um, off of I think it was Plans, and yeah, that was the only one I I found by them, and I really liked it. But it was on some like weird uh, music software that like subsequently shut down, <laughs> and then. I think eventually after, I think when I really checked them out again was after hearing um, uh, this one of the songs, I think it was Ghosts of Beverly Drive on the radio one time. Um, and I had like heard a couple other uh, Death Cab songs on the radio before and liked them, but I really liked that one. Um, so I was really into that one. So I went back to kind of check out more of their stuff. And then kind of like slowly went through their discography after that. Okay, well, I'm Ellie. Um, I've been a fan of Death Cab for Cutie for about um, like maybe a few months now. But I've known of their music for a lot longer. I just haven't really started listening to it a lot uh, until the past few months, like around August 2022. How'd you get introduced to their music? Well, it was really just my mom, because she she always listened to her music. She was actually the owner of one of the first Death Cab for Cutie fan sites. Back in back when, like, song about airplanes, we have the facts, that era. And that's the hint. I just got introduced to their music through my mom, basically. Seeing music live, to me, is important because you're seeing the truest version of what an artist is, is writing and is trying to convey both emotionally and musically. And I think with a a band like Death Cab, where so much of their music is about the emotion and the lyrics, I think seeing them live is something, at least that I haven't experienced that I want to, and something I think people really resonate with. Have you seen them live? Yeah, yeah. So um, I've actually seen them four times. Uh, the first time I saw them was in 2009. So that was in support of the Narrow Stairs album. And um, that was still in Alabama. And uh, it was a fantastic show. And um, I went with my brother-in-law, who was a little bit younger than me. He was, he was a fan as well. And then um, the following year, I moved up to North Carolina, which is where I live now, in uh, the Raleigh area. And uh, I saw them in, let's see, I think it was 2012. So that would have been Codes and Keys. 2015, which was in Kintsugi, Kintsugi, and then I just saw them uh, this last fall uh, for the Asphalt Meadows tour. Um, so all three of those actually were different venues. Uh, one was Coca Booth, one was Red Hat, and this last one was at Walnut Creek. So it was kind of cool to see them in three different places here in Raleigh. Yes, I have. Um, it was February. Um, I don't exactly remember the date. Uh, but it was mid-February, maybe, Feb- I think February 7th, but I'm not entirely sure. And I saw them at their Tulsa, Oklahoma show. And how was your experience at the concert? It was pretty good. The music was really cool. It was still a wonderful time. 
No, I actually have it, which is um, very unfortunate. I don't know how I haven't seen them live. Um, I think it was probably, I know once I like kind of was really a fan of them, they were kind of in between albums for a little bit. And I think after they, like some of their more recent releases just between like COVID and then I think just maybe like not being able to make a couple shows here and there for like different kind of a, uh, uh, conflicts that I wasn't able to see them. So no, I haven't seen them live, which is, uh, very unfortunate. One of these has, uh, oh yeah, this one has this thing where it has like all the EPs and, uh, whichever one was available at the time. I like that one. Um, this one I really liked because it has like uh, like all this yoga and stuff and like Tai Chi <laughs> whatever is going on with these these people and all the dots cut out of the, the thing. So I always thought that one was cool. And then transatlanticism is so cool because it has the little string with the bird and you know all this cool stuff with the uh, all the birds and strings, which is funny because there's not that many songs on it about birds or strings. <laughs> That year that I got into them, um, I, I was a poor college student. <laughs> and uh, so for my birthday that year, later in that year, I asked my wife to get me the photo album on CD. That was back when CDs were a thing. And I remember I had not heard a single song. And I remember sitting in the living room that night after we put the kids to bed. And I just listened to that album like three or four times. And that was just it was amazing. And I was like, oh my gosh, this, and that's still one of my favorite albums. It's not my favorite album, but it is one of them. And so that would be the media that I think of when I think of owning stuff, but I have everything but codes and keys on vinyl. Um, actually I have two copies of transatlanticism because long story short, I was worried that I would never get that on, on vinyl because it's hard to get. And then I ended up getting two copies. Do you own any physical death cab media? Sadly, I don't have any physical Death Cab for Cutie album or, like, merchandise. I wish I could, though. If you could have any physical media, what would you want? A vinyl or CD of Kintsugi. Um, yes, I have a Narrow Stairs uh, vinyl. And I also had uh, a number of years ago, so... When I was in high school, my mom's van didn't have Bluetooth or an aux cord or anything, so I was buying CDs. So I had, um, I know I had like narrow stairs, codes and keys, um, plans all on CD when I was in high school as well. I don't know where those are now, um, but yeah, so I, I have a couple of their albums, either on CD or records. Do you feel like having that experience of the only music you really could listen to in the car was CDs? Did that make that music feel more intentional? Like make it feel like more purposeful? Like this was the like it's a desert island scenario. You can only yeah. have three CDs. These are them. Yeah, I think for me, um, I'm I'm like really an album person. Like if I'm sitting down to listen to music, I really like uh, sitting down to listen to albums in their entirety. And I think that maybe that was kind of the start of that is that if I was going to listen to music in the car, which I have to like pick, you know, here are my favorite albums. I'm going to get these CDs so I can listen to these in the car. Do you feel like CDs in their popular era felt more purposeful than how music does today with unlimited yeah. streaming? That's a fantastic question. So I was a CD collector all growing up as a teenager. I think when I graduated high school, I had somewhere in the neighborhood of 250 to 300 CDs. That's just what I would spend my money on. And funny story in college, again, poor college student, I actually sold about 90% of my CDs to buy an iPod, okay? <laughs> so that I can have an iPod. And I was like, I was thinking this is a good investment because I can put all my music on one tiny little device and listen to whatever I want to listen to. Um, 
and then I got, and then when my friend gave me those two albums on MP3, obviously added them to the iPod. And then I was like, I need to get everything else by this band. And so that's when I got the photo album and then something about airplanes. We have the facts, all the other ones. And, um, and, and that's kind of when I started collecting CDs again. So I, I don't have a lot of CDs. I, again, I saved a few of sentimental ones, but when I buy CDs, it's for bands that I absolutely love. And so now my CD collection is maybe 30 or 35, but 10 of them are death cab. I wanted to try to get all of them, but I kind of got to here and I was like, I think this is a good point to, you know, stop before it gets out of hand. Uh, but probably my, the most interesting one I have is the directions DVD where it has all the, all that, the songs from the album and it's, it's supposed to be like a, a visual uh, a visual album where and each song has a different director for its video on it and they're not short films they're almost like uh, pieces of, of visual art for each one and i just think it's really interesting and it's fun to pop on every now and then you know just really be intentional about yeah it's called a, a visual companion to the album so that to me is really interesting A lot of people consider I Will Follow You Into the Dark either one of their best songs, their favorite sad song, their best song in general, or their favorite song in general or, or something. And, and it's crazy because the song has something like 1.3 billion plays on Spotify. It's incredibly popular. But at the same time, you may ask someone who says that's their favorite song you know, what we have the facts and we're voting yeses, and they'll have no idea. And I think that's just a, it's a, a common theme across dedicated musical fan bases where, or rather any media, where a certain artist will have a deep catalog of, of media or music or, or, or art or something, and the more dedicated fans will seek out the most obsolete or, or non-current version of what that artist makes and try to pick it apart and try to find something that's really interesting and really bold and creative in those things. And uh, to me, so many people love Death Cab. A lot of people really like them. They're a very popular band, but it still feels like that kind of dedicated group is so small compared to all the people who really like their popular stuff. Do you think being a fan of Death Cab for Cutie is niche or cult? Well, like, people that like really like some of their like less popular songs, I think that's like, might be like a pretty small community, but like the community as a whole is pretty big, especially because there's a whole, a whole Reddit and Discord about it. <laughs> I think, yeah, maybe a little bit, um, just because with them having enough success where they did get, like, big radio play and were able to kind of make it with some, like, bigger record labels, um, there's definitely, you know, a lot of people who are more kind of casual fans, just like, I mean, kind of how I started, like, I, I just heard them on the radio and, and really liked one of their songs, especially because they have so many albums now that not definitely not everyone's going back to kind of listen to all of it and get out some of the earlier stuff which maybe isn't like as polished um because that's how i was with them for a while like i it took me a long time to kind of get back far enough in their discography to go listen to um we have the facts uh, and we're voting yes and the photo album it's almost like a a different band when you get back to those two so it's it's very interesting to kind of um go to those albums and see how they started and evolved to the band they are now do you think being a fan of death cab for cutie is niche or cult gosh i don't know um i mean i think there probably are a lot of people that only like the songs that have been popular um but the songs that 
those popular songs that maybe introduced them to the band and they learned more. I, I find that Death Cab fans seem to be a little bit more dedicated potentially to the band than maybe other bands. Um, but I don't know that I would use the word cult. <laughs> but um, but yeah, I mean, I, I feel, I mean, I, I know every song off every album. Like I, I mean, when a new album comes out, I devour it for weeks, you know, and it's like, it's hard, it's hard to imagine if somebody loves a band so much that they wouldn't have listened to every single song, if that makes sense. When doing research for this project, on TikTok, I just searched Death Cab for Cutie. What popped up was just uh, these these kind of sketches or, or, or funny videos of people saying millennials listening to their sad music alone in a room and it'd be this dude like bopping out. And a lot of people assigning the millennial generation to Death Cab for Cutie. And I wanted to see like, oh, well, how do these this dedicated group feel about the band because millennials are probably the largest fan base largest generation in that fan base but i'm 24 so i don't think i'm millennial but i just find it i'm not gen i'm gen z did yeah. they just skip gen y i don't know anyway <laughs> it sounds like millennials are the largest uh portion of that fan base and i wanted to just explore like what is what the perception of the fan base is. How old would you say the average Death Cab for Cutie fan is? Maybe around like 17 to like 25 maybe. And why do you think that is? They've had like, their older albums have got like a lot of people into them, but then, then there's also their newer stuff. That's also pretty popular. Yeah, I mean, judging from the concerts that I've been to, it's generally, I think, people in their mid to late 20s to, to early 50s um, because of just when the band came out. Um, I went to the last concert with my two teenagers, and they love the band, and we're very excited to see them. And so I'm hoping that they can reach that next generation and you know expand their horizons to the Gen Z. But um, yeah, I would say probably Gen Xers would be the main people that uh that listen to them um i don't know about people much older than 50 though because you know if, if 2003 is when they sort of hit it big um even people that were teenagers then you know or even in their 20s they still wouldn't be in their 50s so uh, yeah i would probably put it somewhere between 30 and 45 would be the average fan base or fan, fan age oh that's Oh, that's such a hard one. I feel like, I don't know, teenagers are forever going to be, like, sad and angsty to, like, um, you know, transatlanticism and, and um, some, of, some of those other albums. So I think they're probably, you know, always getting kind of new and, and younger fans. Um, just because they are such a well-known band. Um, but then they, since they've been around since uh, the late 90s, or like mid to late 90s, um, I don't know, they've had like a solid 25 years to pick up fans. So if I had to guess the average, I'd probably go with like a very solid, like I would, I would think that their fan base would span from like, mid teens to like people in their like 40s at this point um uh, and and possibly even later um i don't know maybe there's a chance that people who are kind of like older fans at this point maybe um have like outgrown the music a little bit but i think i'd probably put it at like a solid like early to mid 30s for the average i, I would imagine that they have like a really really wide age range covered Do you identify as emo? Do I identify as emo? Well, first, let's break down. What does emo mean? Emo, to me, means sensitive or not wanting to 
think about your emotions more than you need to. And do I think I'm emo? Yes, I do. You're emo. I you think I'm emo. emo. I think I'm emo. I think I'm emo enough. Do you? But you. You know how okay, you know you how people will say. Music. That's for sure. Yes. Would you describe yourself as emo? Yeah, I think so. <laughs> um, I've at least uh, in terms of like you know somebody who listens to emo music, uh, I definitely check that box. Um, but I think uh, I've always felt like I'm a I'm a pretty sensitive person. Um, I don't know, maybe at the whim of my emotions. Would you describe yourself as emo? Not really. <laughs> I mean, I, I don't know that I listen to any other band that would be described as emo. That's what's weird about it. I, I just, I, yeah, I would say no. <laughs> would you say Death Cab for Cutie is emo? Well, I know they've been described as that. I, I don't think they are, but I would probably more describe them as just alternative rock that that has some emo tendencies. So that's probably the best. I don't, I don't generally consider them emo. Would you describe yourself as emo? No. Oh, come on. I thought for sure. What does emo mean to you? Well, emo for me is like a large like music genre, which I'm not really into that music genre as a whole, really. Because like I like some songs, like um, the something about airplane songs, and like maybe like one <clears throat> MCR song, but like that's really the extent of it. Would you say Death Cab for Cutie is emo? Um. No. Like, Something About Airplanes is, like, the only album I would consider emo. Maybe a bit of We Have the Facts, but, because, like, like, title track, that might be considered emo, but, like, Company Calls, that, I wouldn't really consider that emo. And then, like, <clears throat> the photo album and beyond, it's just not really emo in, like, my eyes, really. Something that I hear a lot of people talk about is how certain music is objectively good or bad due to a variety of reasons, whether that be on a, a musical theory level or a uh, uh, general appeal level, like something that's more popular might be more or less objectively good due to its popularity, which I think is kind of uh, narrow-minded to just look at popularity to determine quality um, and you in there is there's a variety of you know critical elements that go into determining if music is good or bad but I think one thing a lot of people can agree on is it's a lot easier to determine if something like a movie is a good or bad movie or if a book is a good or bad book but I think because music is something people have grown to take very personally and very seriously, I think it's a lot harder to assign quality to uh, something that's, that's intended to be personal. Do you think Death Cab makes objectively good music? I do. I mean, just because I don't really feel like there are any weaknesses in their, in their music. Like when I listen to an album, I feel like it, there's a good flow of the music. Um, I mean, it's hard to it's hard to compare anyone to the Beatles or to Mozart, but I mean, I, I, there are bands that I like where I'll listen to one or two of their albums and I really like them, and then and then a couple albums later, I'm like, I'm not really into this, you know. And and they've managed to hold me now for 18 years, where every album that comes out, I just I just can't wait, and it, and it never lets me down. Um, and I don't really look at the album and think, oh man, that song sucks, or I don't like that one, or why are they doing this? What direction are they going in? Like, I just haven't had that at all. 
um, now for 18 years. Yes, their music is amazing. He's like, um, well, their songwriting for one is great. Uh, the band members are amazing at what they do, and it's just all comes together to make a really good band and really good songs. Um, yes, uh, like, yeah, it's obviously hard to kind of say, you know, objectively good music, but. Um, I look at it from the sense of, you know, being, um, you know, making my own music and doing like the production side of of things for that, um, the songwriting side, and then like kind of the final like editing of that. Um, and they just are really solid. And I think all of those aspects, um, you know, the people. Like I, th- I think maybe people ha- can have their like opinions about whether they like, um, you know, Death Cab's approach to making songs and everything. Uh, but when you look at just you know the the production and kind of the final product that they put out, it's always really solid. It sounds great. Um, they all play their instruments very well. You know from as like in a performance sense, they just do a good job to like bring some life and emotion into the music itself. And I think, you know, Ben Gibbard is, is a a pretty good lyricist, a pretty good writer. So I think, you know, even if you, it's not necessarily your cup of tea, I think that they're definitely making solid music. My two favorite Death Cab for Cutie songs are No Joy in Mudville, which is on We Have the Facts and We're Voting Yes, and Brothers in a Hotel Bed, which is on Plans. And uh, they're both incredibly deep and sad and and songs that deal with death in some way or uh, relationships moving on or people aging and, and... basically loss in an abstract concept it's in a lot of death cab's music people always attributed death cab's music to being sad music and being emo and being music for people who are sad and looking outside of death cab as a whole is sad music is seen as something that maybe not people who are struggling will listen to but if you're someone who really likes sad music it somehow implies that you're cynical or or that you're not happy in some way or that there's something that you're looking to change in your life and i don't i just don't think that's true but i also don't know why people listen to sad music and when looking at Death Cab for Cutie's catalog, a lot of their more popular stuff and a lot of their uh, critically considered best work is also their saddest. Do you think Death Cab mostly makes sad music? There's definitely a lot of sadness in their music, yes. Um, death, depression, um, breaks, breakups, you know, relationship trauma. Um, yeah, yeah, I would, I would. There's not, there's not a ton of happy songs, but I, I kind of like that. It, I'm not generally a sad person, but it does tend to help me think about things in life that are unpleasant to think about and. Um, I don't know, it, it elicits emotion, which is, I think, a good thing when you're listening to music is to, is to feel emotion. Kind of, well, like, some of their songs definitely are more sad. Like, some of, like, Thank You For Today, um, Asphalt Meadows, um, Cousin Keys, Kintsugi. Like, some of those albums have some sad songs in them, a- along with other albums. Like, some of them are, like, like a lot of them are, like, really upbeat and stuff. So, some of them? Um, yes. 
I'm not sure exactly what ratio I'd put it on put on it, but um, I would think it's at maybe like at least seventy five percent sad. That's up there. <laughs> um, yeah, just I, I I would definitely say yes. Maybe not always sad, but at the at the minimum, like melancholic. Mm. Um, or some you know other other synonyms or or closely related words. So I think I I would agree with that. Not every song. Um, there's definitely songs where they're taking like more of a kind of chill approach to it. Um, you know, even some some happy songs. But yeah, I I think I would say that they're the majority is definitely sad. Going off of that, do you think that their best music? is also their saddest. I think their best music is their saddest. My favorite album is Narrow Stairs, and that album is incredibly sad and depressing and bleak. And there are not many happy songs on that album. I think even Ben Gibbard said that's the lowest he wanted to go. Um, and it's my favorite album. So yeah, I, I think I think that would be a fair thing to say. Not really. It feels like, I feel like my favorite albums can see me, which... Yeah, it does have a lot of sad songs, but then I also like some other albums that are like more like happier sounding. So, kind of, but not really. Um, I, I would kind of, I think I'd say yes to that. Um, not necessarily that their sad music is their best just because it's like an outright fact um i think i'd say yes just because of you know like i said the volume of of sad music that they have but i definitely think that there are songs that they've made that are really great that aren't sad ones um you know one that comes to my mind is uh blacking out the friction uh from the photo album um, you know, it's a pretty upbeat, uh, pretty lively song. And I think that's, um, at least for, for me right now, that's like one of my favorites of theirs. So I don't know that I would, I would say that um, some of their sad music is their best music, but I don't think it necessarily um, makes the music better for like their sad stuff. I know that's like uh, a bit of a uh, hotly contested topic um for the last couple albums um but i don't think i i agree with it like outright people need sad music because it reminds them that things that make you sad are only temporary and in many ways necessary for the other things in life to be as good as they are. With how bleak things seem in the world, it, it almost seems necessary that people need things to help them through this overwhelming bleakness and, and things that just seem like so horrible that caused so much pain and suffering for so many people that it only makes sense that in something as personal as music we sometimes need those sad moments to, to show us that it's okay and that other people are dealing with these things too things will change and things will get better if they don't get better right away then there's going to be someone there to help you with it, whether it's a friend, a loved one, or just the whoever wrote the song that you're listening to. Why do people listen to sad music? Well, I think it's because like they can relate to it which helps them feel better because, like, it's not only them feeling those feelings. Because, like, 
through that music, they know that they're not alone in feeling these sad thoughts and feelings. And that there's others out there that are feeling the same as they are, which makes which might make them feel a bit better knowing that they're not alone. Uh, and this is going to be my last question. Why do you think people listen to sad music? I think for me, it's just always been a way to get in touch with what I'm feeling, what I'm thinking. I think sometimes I don't spend enough time kind of uh, processing like some of the things that I've been holding in. You know, if you're going through something or, or feel in some way, then maybe you just want to kind of have something that helps you express that or helps you um, work through those feelings. Maybe you just want to like hear a Death Cab for Cutie song where he's also talking about being sad, just so you can feel like, um, I don't know, like you're not alone in those emotions and things like that. Also, some sad songs are just bangers. <laughs> um, I can only speak for myself, I guess, and it's a lot of the stuff that I just said, but I think it, I think it helps us cope with, I mean, life is not always perfect, right? Life is not always easy. And so when there's music that can help us deal with some of those emotions or help us cope with certain things that we're going through, it's more meaningful than just a, a pop song that you bop your head to. Um, and it makes us, I think, feel a little bit more human. I like sad music because it, things in life happen very quickly and people are today are so focused on moving on and, and thinking about the next thing because the next thing is what they really want to do and they don't focus on how they're feeling in the moment sometimes and, and sad music to me can remind me to go back and, and feel those things that I was supposed to feel when when I, I make it through hardships or or, or I accomplish something and, and I think people just don't give themselves enough credit for existing today and I think sad music is a way of you know acknowledging it I have to pee really bad, so let's go back so I can pee.